Well, for as long as the church of Jesus Christ has been in existence, there has always been the need for a place for us to gather. Of course, we Christians know that the church is not a building. Rather, the church is a gathered assembly of people. So you all, beloved, those who are in Christ, are the church of the living God. The building is where we come to worship and gather together. Now, in the early years, when the church was young in Jerusalem, Jewish Christians met in synagogues and they met in private homes. Once persecution began and drove them underground, however, Christians began to meet secretly in their houses and even in caves. By the fourth century, the Romans were building very large and stately church buildings, and by the Middle Ages, the church was meeting in castles and cathedrals. The Protestant Reformation, however, dislodged many local churches from their historic buildings and made way for smaller gatherings to come together. The Puritan settlers to America erected very simple meeting houses, which still functions as a model for even our church facilities today. Even this style of building is modeled after the early settlers of this country. And yet, Western civilization and the Western church seems to have sort of a love-hate relationship with buildings. On the one hand, we love our buildings, our big, tall, white, classic, elegant church buildings. But many churchgoers veer almost into uh, too far into this love to the point where they almost love the building too much. Of the idle worship of buildings, I've actually coined a term that I use, archaeology, where we worship the buildings to describe people's unhealthy obsession with the church building. Others, however, lurch in the opposite direction, a direction that is desiring to see the church rid herself completely of all real estate. Somehow, the owning of property and maintaining a building is an irresponsible waste of monies that could be going otherwise to missions. But I believe this is a false dichotomy. I don't think these two line up. First of all, if you have no place to meet together, by definition, you cease to be an assembly, number one. But more importantly, I think that there's, the view doesn't take into account how the Lord actually uses buildings and gathering places to serve His sovereign purposes. In fact, one of the most vivid and dynamic occurrences of God's use for a building occurs in Exodus chapter 25. So if you have your copy of Scripture, turn over to Exodus chapter 25 this morning. Now, I intend to walk us briefly through 16 chapters of Scripture today, but I hope to do it in such a way that will actually be helpful to you and not confusing. We will not cover every single verse, I promise. But to set up this whole thing, in the book of Exodus, we see that the Israelites are being led by Moses. They've come out of Egypt. If you've seen the Ten Commandments movie, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you've at least seen maybe the story of how they were led out of bondage in Egypt through the Red Sea where they are set to inherit the promised land that's waiting for them on the other side. However, Israel's relationship with God is based on what we know to be a covenant agreement. God tells the Israelites, I will be your God and you will be my people. And as God's people, they are commanded to obey his laws, which we find demonstrated in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not all we have, but that's kind of the baseline for what God commands of his people. But primarily, we are to worship the Lord, giving glory to him in all that we do. However, this will not be a distant relationship. God doesn't just set us and forget us. Rather, he desires not to be disconnected and be far away, but desires to come and dwell with his people. Now it's this desire that occasions what takes place in Exodus chapter 25. So look at Exodus 25 with me, just the first couple of verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution." This is the contribution which you are to raise from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, 
oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and the breastpiece. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you as a pattern of the tabernacle and a pattern of all its furniture, so shall, or just so you shall construct it. So the Lord calls the people to make a contribution to him. Now he qualifies the contribution. He says this is to be from every man whose heart moves him. This is going to become a very important statement that gets repeated oft in this section. But this is to be a free will offering. This is voluntary. And then he delineates what kind of offering he's looking for. And you just look back at the passage here. Verse 3, he says, gold and silver and bronze, precious metals. Verse 4, various kinds of linens and fabrics. Verse 5, expensive materials and wood for building. Verse 6, oils and fragrant incense. In incense. Verse 7, expensive stones and gems. Friends, this is not cheap bargain basement deal busters. This is not the cheapest possible materials we can find. Rather, this is, these are nice materials and expensive materials, costly materials. For what purpose? Verse 8, he says, let them construct a sanctuary for me. It's not even for them. It's for me, the Lord says, that I may dwell among them. This word sanctuary refers to a holy place, a place that is set apart for the purpose of worshiping God. We know the sanctuary comes to be known as the tabernacle. Tabernacle quite literally means a dwelling place, a place to pitch a tent where you can reside inside, a dwelling place for God. Now, we know that God is spirit. God does not need a house to be built by human hands. He doesn't need our building for him to dwell, but rather God desires that people would gather together for our purposes here to worship him and that there would be a place where we could identify that place as holy. Again, God doesn't need a building, but in many ways, we do. And then verse 9, he says, I'm going to give them a pattern to follow for the building of this tabernacle. I'm going to give them a blueprint so even God in the Bible sanctions blueprints for a building to be built. And so the next seven chapters in this passage, in this book of the Bible, seven chapters here give forth the details of how they are to construct the tabernacle. The Israelites are to create the, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. This one item, the Ark of the Covenant, don't think about Indiana Jones here, but think about the Ark that God sanctioned and that ark is is designated to be identified with his presence wherever the ark would go is that where the presence of the lord would be and so this ark with the mercy seat that's where the blood sacrifice was going to be made for the atonement of the sins of the people they were to construct a table for the showbread and a lampstand chapter 26 he talks about the curtains and the boards and the veils that are going to be used chapter 27 the bronze altar and the court, as well as the instructions for the oil. Chapter 28, he gives the uh, instructions for the priest's clothing, following the instructions for the consecration in, in chapter 29. Chapter 30 pertains to the altar of incense and the money for the atonement and the laver where they would perform their ceremonial washings and the anointing oil and the incense. Chapter 21 even identifies those who are charged with leading this building project. And he actually even names them, two men, Bezalel and Aholiab. These two men are their, their leaders in this building project. And at the end of chapter 31, God gives them a sign of their covenant relationship. And that sign was to be the Sabbath day, the special day, one out of seven where they are gathered together to worship the Lord. Now in Israel, keeping the Sabbath was a really important thing. We're going to see in a, a couple chapters now that you were to keep the Sabbath under penalty of death. Now we understand that that does not translate over to us today. There's lots of reasons for that which we'll talk about. But the point here is that was a serious thing. God takes his worship and our gathering together as a serious thing. And so that was the sign of this covenant between them and God. 
Now at this point, you would think that the people were excited about the prospect of building the tabernacle and creating this place where God would dwell with them. But by chapter 32, and if you know your Bible, you know this is a very difficult chapter even to read. In chapter 32, Moses goes up onto the mountain to meet with God, and the people grow tired of waiting. They get sick and tired of waiting for Moses to come back down from the mountain. So you'd think now, reasoning with me here, that they would wait for Moses, and while they're waiting for him, they would have at least started with building the tabernacle. They have the blueprints, right? You'd think that they would have used their skills and their creativity uh, to build the tabernacle, but instead, they use their skills and their creativity to construct a golden calf. And they begin to worship the calf as their God. And they say, this calf, this God, is the one who led us through the Red Sea. Obviously, this grievous sin enraged both God and Moses. And yet Moses intercedes for them and begs God for mercy on behalf of the people. And then in chapter 33, the Israelites, they repent They mourn their sin. They apologize to God. They get right with God with contrition of their heart. They weep and they mourn because of their sinfulness. And it's on the heels of that repentance that Moses ventures back up to the Mount Sinai to encounter the glory of the Lord in Exodus chapter 34. When he returns from the mountain... God's residual glory that was shining on him is now radiating from his face. So bright, in fact, that he has to wear a veil everywhere he goes so that people aren't blinded by the glory that they see reflected off of him. But this demonstrates to the people that God is holy and God is righteous and God is pure and he's worthy of their worship. And then chapter 35, there is something of a second chance here. And if you turn over to chapter 35, we read this. Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire of any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as the Lord's contribution. Gold, silver, bronze, and blue and purple and scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and porpoise skins, and acacia wood, and oil for the lighting, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod and the breastpiece. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Notice this essentially repeats what we read about back in chapter 25. Now, there's been a a little bit of a time stamp. There's been several weeks at this point where they have forgotten, and Moses says, I'm going to remind you of what the Lord already told us to do. And then, starting in chapter 36, we see these builders... Bezalel and Aholiab, they get to work. Now these chapters, chapter 35 and 36, are very interesting for us. They give us a window into what kind of people God used to construct his tabernacle. Look over at chapter 35, verse 31. Notes that Bezalel, the builder, was filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all craftsmanship. Along with this man Aholiab, we read that God gives them both gifts of service and a desire and wisdom. This isn't just random grunt laborers or hired hands. These are spirit-filled men who God has blessed with the task of constructing the tabernacle. And what about the people? Those who are giving and serving. Over and over again, we read this quality of their heart and of their devotion. We read in chapter 35, verse 21, everyone who's, listen to this, whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work. 
Verse 26, and all the women whose heart stirred with skill to use their abilities for this work. Verse 29, all the men and women whose heart moved them to bring material for the work. Chapter 36, verse 2, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work to perform it. Friends, this was more than a building project. This was an act of love and devotion by those whose hearts were stirred within them to serve God and to serve the people of God. Beloved, this was worship. They brought their skills and their talents and their money and their materials and their time and their very heart to worship God. And then chapters 36 through 40, the laborers go through and they complete everything according to plan. Everything that's laid out in the, in the previous seven chapters gets completed in the next couple chapters exactly to the specifications given. And then we read about this. Flip over to chapter 40 for a minute here. Chapter 40, what happens at the very, very end of the whole thing? Chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys, wherever the cloud was taken up, from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the glory cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. This is remarkable. This is remarkable. God displays His glory we saw this a couple weeks ago when we talked about Jesus' uh, walk up the Mount of Transfiguration, this glory cloud that appears before uh, Peter and James and John, the same glory cloud, the manifestation, the visible manifestation of the glory of God to us. This glory cloud descends on this construction, on this building, and the glory fills the tabernacle with God's visible presence. Why? Why did he do this? It was to demonstrate to them that he was with them. I'm with you. The dwelling place of the presence of God in the tabernacle was a sign that not only did he approve of the work that they had done, but he accepted their offering of worship. Now, again, we know that the eternal God does not dwell in buildings. He doesn't need the dwelling buildings. God doesn't even need this building. But we know that nearly 15 centuries after the Israelites built the tabernacle, the Lord himself chose to dwell in another tabernacle of sorts. And in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, tells us that the, that the eternal God, who has always existed and will always exist, he specifically refers to God as the Word. He gives him a, a title here, a name. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Now, the Greek word dwelt here could be also translated tabernacled. That God himself, the eternal God, tabernacled and even pitched his tent among us. How did he do this? Well, he came down from heaven and took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. The God of heaven came to earth as a man born of Mary while she was still a virgin. He lived on earth for 33 years, never once sinned against the commands of God. The Son lived and He suffered persecution, and He was killed on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He died in the place of His people, a substitute sufferer. And the Father's wrath was poured out on Him. He died and was buried and then rose again the third day, and the Bible says that all who call upon his name, who trust in him, who believe in him, who turn from their sins in repentance, would have the gift of everlasting life. We know that to be the message of the gospel. That's the gospel, the good news that we have. Not that God kills us in our place when we sin against him, but rather that God poured out the wrath on his son so that we would not have to die. And all the commands of the law are fulfilled in Christ. And we come to him 
by faith and through grace. This is more, however, than a get-out-of-hell-free card, my friends. Salvation consists of a new life, a new hope, a new relationship, a new union. And the Bible tells us that all of us are born in sin. All of us are born with a sin nature. And it manifests a sinful heart all throughout our, our whole lifetime. It's like as soon as I want to stop sinning, I can't. And I can't balance the scales. All of us have sinfulness in our life. And the only way for a person to be saved is not for God to simply ignore their wickedness. God doesn't sidestep sin. Otherwise, He wouldn't be holy. Rather, God's solution is to remake us from the inside out. We call this regeneration. But Jesus uses the language being born again being born a second time. In fact, in John 3, 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, the Pharisee, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so you must experience a new, not physical birth, but a new spiritual rebirth. And how does that happen? How do you become born again? Well, the Spirit of God must take up residence within your heart and get this, He must dwell in in you he must make his home in you and so he dwells within you and once he does this he begins to change you he gives you a new heart that believes in God and trusts in God and hates your sin but then you begin to think differently you feel differently and then what you love changes and what you say begins to change and what you do begins to change and he continues to change you day by day, and every single day you begin to look more and more like Jesus Christ. And so Christians are those who have been forgiven by God, saved by Jesus Christ, and indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And because of this, 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us that we are temples of God and have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that our bodies, our bodies, my friends, are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so if that is true, then our hearts are as well, which is why we are to glorify the Lord God with our whole life. Glorify Him with what you do, what you say, what you think, how you serve, how you give. Your whole life becomes an act of worship to the Lord and with this, Romans 8.11 tells us that it's by the Spirit that we are given new life to our mortal bodies. He invigorates us. He grows us spiritually. He heals us from the inside out. Not that we become perfect in this life, because, my friends, we don't. Every Christian, every Christian is a work in progress. And you might be asking yourself, okay, what does this have to do with a building? Where does this fit in? Well, this building is where we all come to meet with God in worship and to meet with one another in fellowship. We will worship God in this sanctuary. We will greet each other in the gathering room. We will fellowship downstairs in the fellowship hall. We will grow together in the classrooms. We will receive counsel and encouragement here. And we will pray with one another here. Our children, by God's grace, will marry here. And when the Lord calls us home, we will send each other off with tears and with love right here. And by God's grace, this building will serve the needs of God's people for decades to come. And because of the, the indwelling presence of the Spirit within us, when we gather together here, God is in our midst. Does God care about a building? He does if His people are gathered together there to worship Him. He does. Well, how do you know if you belong to Him? How do you know if you're His people? Well, we talked about it earlier. If you recognize, if there's anything in you that recognizes that your life is not what it's supposed to be. That you have sinned against a holy God and you just can't get it right. 
you've lived according to your own way and you've rebelled against the purposes of God and recognize if I don't fix something, if something doesn't change in me, I'm doomed. And if you recognize the need for God to redeem you, to save you, to rescue you, if that need exists within you, cry out to God. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And then trust in Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for you on the cross, who died your death in your place, suffered all the wrath of God that's meant for you. Turn away from your sinful life and trust in Him with your whole life. And the Bible says you will have everlasting life. God will forgive your sins once and for all. And when you die, when your body fails you, and you go into the ground, your soul, who you really are, will dwell with him forever. Believe that today, my friends. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, today is the perfect day to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That you pierce us down deep between the soul and the spirit and joints and marrow that you bore down deep inside of us and you convict us of our sins, our transgressions, our rebellion. But also you assure us of the gospel truths that Jesus Christ is our life and that by his death and resurrection, we have eternal life. And so, Lord, we are here again today to worship you in spirit and truth. And Lord, it is our prayer that what we do, even from today moving forward, would be pleasing to you in every possible way. Lord, thank you for the event of this day. And as we proceed for the next couple of minutes, Lord, we pray that everything we do and say would be pleasing to you. And Lord, we know that we are not expecting the visible glory cloud to descend on this place. Lord, we do wait for you with constant expectancy that you will move in our hearts, convict us of our sinfulness, increase our joy and our thanksgiving, give us more and more assurance of our salvation, and fill us, Lord, with prayers of thanksgiving. We ask all these things even now in Jesus' name. Amen.